How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates. I am McKay. And I am Jordan. And welcome to Satan's Ponzi Scheme 2022. Hey, guess what? It's the same as last year. Sorry. Uh, We're just going to be doing the same shit. So if you were hoping, yeah, they're finally going to stop doing what they're doing. Bong. Sad day for you. So, yeah, welcome. We are going to continue our video series on... uh, or I guess video slash podcast series on the temple and uh, ordinances. I didn't even know what we're talking about today. <laughs> like on side note, our YouTube content is now available via podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. So thank you to the people who have been listening already. We've already yes. got a bunch of listeners. We've already got people reviewing the podcast. You guys are amazing. We appreciate that. So uh, yeah, keep on listening if that's what you want to do. So as promised, we talked about baptisms for the dead last time. Yep. Um, if you want to check that one out, you can go. I'll put a, uh, a card right here and you can click on that and get caught up. Um, that one is kind of one on its own because it is the only... Um, ordinance that the that children can participate in really yeah. um, so the ones from here on out are only for people who are 18 years or older or done with sunday school is what the the manual the manual or whatever the the church sets forth so we're jumping from baptisms for the dead which is the first one these go in a proper order so once you turn 18 Um, You either go on a mission or you get married. And before either of those things can happen, you have to have two ordinances done. So baptisms for the dead doesn't really matter. Yeah, baptisms is, yeah, it's just additional stuff that you do. And none of those you do for yourself. You've already been baptized when you go to the temple. So that's only for other people. So you don't, we probably should have clarified that in the last video, but you don't, like as a member of the church, you don't get baptized in the temple. You get baptized in a church building. Yeah. Because they have fonts in the church building. So. So this is the first of three ordinances that you do for yourself. And then after you return and do them for dead people, just like the baptism. So after a dead person, you were baptized for a dead person, you would take that same name and go and do these other things for and behalf on behalf of however they worded um so this one is the first of a two-parter the the video the episodes for this are pretty much probably going to be three different ones because this is the first very short part that has had a lot of changes so we want to kind of set up everything for the next part which is the endowment so the first part is the washing and anointing which is what we're going to talk about today and then the second part is the endowment proper which is going to be a behemoth of probably two episodes to get through because it's really long (laughs) and there's a lot of stuff that we have to hit on in order to uh, make it make sense to everybody. Yes. And even then it probably won't make sense. These things are very complex. So they're coming off to you like, what the hell? It comes off that way to Mormons as well. Yeah. Just imagine you're 18 years old. Literally you, you graduated high school. You, you did the, the academic thing that everybody does you have this fresh outlook on the world and this is what you're stepping into you're about to go on a mission and the only thing people will say to you is oh it gets less weird as you get older oh you learn more when you get older and i did it in two different languages and i was still not really getting a lot of the quote-unquote symbolism and things like that. They tell you it was my least favorite thing that people would say to me about the temple is the more you go, the more you'll understand, the more it will be revealed to you. And no. No. Um, You can, I mean, obviously we only, we are in our 20s, so we did not go years and years and years worth of time. But you can ask older Mormons. There's plenty of them. Mormon Stories yep. podcasts where they'll tell you the same thing. I went and I went and I went for years and years and it never, never made got any sense. better. So here we are. OK, so before we start off, let's see what the official church materials have to say about the endowment, uh, because they do have some reading material that they have put out on their in their official channels. Um the problem is they're like really vague because the Mormons like to keep things that are quote unquote sacred um, private. So you don't really hear about those kinds of things outside of the temple unless they're in what 
Mormons would call anti-Mormon literature exposés. So first off, let's check out thechurchofjesuschrist.org to see what they say. It says about the temple endowment. And I won't read this verbatim, um, but basically what it, it, the, the first paragraph says, your personal gift from God, receiving your temple endowment can be one of the most sacred events of your life. Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> preparing for it will make it more meaningful and powerful. Many members of the church receive their endowment before their mission or marriage. Others simply have a strong desire to move forward along the covenant path. Let me add a little asterisk here. Um, we typically say that you get initiatory endowment. You begin that process either when you're getting married or when you go on a mission. But that is also not completely true because there are some exceptions to that rule. I was one of them. So I wasn't getting married. I wasn't going on a mission. I just told my bishop I was ready to go to the temple. And so I had to take a class, which we'll talk about in a bit. So there are exceptions to the mission and marriage rule, especially if you have like a very, like if you have a much older individual, like late 20s and 30s who isn't getting married or hasn't gone on a mission, it's more common for older members mm -hmm. to just go. Um, so they're not left out of the pinnacle of Mormon experience of going to the temple. Yeah. And that uh, it's kind of weird how that is. And it's kind of on a person to person basis because you just talked with the bishop and he was like, yeah, you're good. Well, I had to meet with the stake president too, but yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, continuing on with the covenant path is what they call like following the gospel just for the uninitiated um, stay either on way, the path. Stay yeah, in the stay boat. Stay on the path. Either way, it's an important. It's important to know that your endowment is more than just another step. It's an essential, glorious part of your eternal journey. You know what? I am going to read all of this because it is. It seems kind of pertinent. <laughs> President Russell M. Nelson, the current prophet of the church, reminded us that quote every activity, every lesson, all we do in the church point to the Lord and His holy house. Our efforts to proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, and redeem the dead all lead to the temple. Each holy temple stands as a symbol of membership in the church, as a sign of our faith in life after death, and as a sacred step toward eternal glory uh, for us and our families, close quote. How many temples are there? We probably should have addressed that. Um, over video. 150. All over the world. Uh, I think over, 100, over 160 at least announced. I don't know how many are in operation right now. I can actually look it up. Okay, 170 dedicated temples, which means completed construction and are ready for use. 161 currently operated and nine previously closed, uh, previously dedicated, but uh, closed for renovation. That includes the Salt Lake Temple. Yep. 45 under construction and 50 more announced that are not under construction. That is probably the highest number of temples that has ever existed. For a total of 265. What a joke. That is a huge increase. So they uh, they definitely want those numbers to look good because it looks like they're expanding, but uh, the growth of membership definitely does not reflect that. But this is how they pull you. It's, called, it's yeah. almost like Scientology. Like every two times a year, they have the conference, and then at the conference, the prophet announces where the temples are going to be built, and they save it for the very, very end of conference. Oh, yeah. And the prophet gets up, and every Mormon is on the edge of their seat. And Mormon Twitter is shitting itself, like, oh my God, there's going to be a temple in Syracuse, Utah. And <laughs> and everybody's no, yeah. losing their shit. And so he, like, even in conference, the prophet says, because there's people generally in the conference center, he's like, please. Don't make any noise. Don't clap. Don't yell because people go nuts yeah, over the stuff. Nuts. So, yeah, that's kind of. Yeah, that's all we'll say on that for, <laughs> for the time being. But, yeah, it's 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 a weird dynamic. Okay, continuing, it says, only in the temple can you receive the ordinances needed to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. Temple ordinances, including the endowment, lead to the greatest blessings offered through the atonement of Jesus Christ. These ordinances help focus on the Savior, his role in our Heavenly Father's plan, and our commitment to follow him. Um, so they talk about being exalted, which is the highest bit of the celestial kingdom. Um, like I talked about last time, there's the, the three kingdoms of glory, right? The celestial kingdom is where you can go if you've been baptized in the Mormon church. But 
you can only go to the lowest tier, I guess, because you haven't received the further light and knowledge is what they use. You haven't done the initiatory, the endowment, yeah. the ceiling. So you're stuck at the bottom of the yeah. heaven list, okay? You're still in heaven. You're still in the the awesome heaven, but you're not in the super duper VIP awesome section of heaven. You're like at the bottom yeah. heaven. <laughs> so you you're at the bottom tier if you just get your in your if you get baptized. You go to the next tier if you get baptized and you are endowed, which is also known as being a ministering angel which blows uh <laughs> and then if you get uh all of that plus you get sealed like jordan and i were get married in the then temple you get exalted and that's like a whole other topic for a, a whole other time which i think at the very end of this we'll talk about exaltation um when it comes to the second anointing it's like peak planet so y'all. yeah what people refer to when they talk about exaltation is Mormons getting their own planets. So we want to talk about that a little more later. It's a lot to go into. And the Mormons watching those are going to shit themselves. And think, yeah. That's not true. That's not true. But we're not getting into that right now. Okay. The last part I wanted to read was uh, right in here. It says, the word endowment means a gift. In this context, the temple endowment is a gift of sacred blessings from God to each of us. The endowment can only be received in his way and in his holy temple which seems to change a lot. Anyway, <laughs> some of the gifts you receive through the temple endowment include, one, greater knowledge of the Lord's purposes and teachings. Not true. Two, power to do all that God wants us to do. Nope. You already have that power within you. Three, divine guidance and protection as we serve the Lord, our families, and others. Four. Bulletproof armies. <laughs> four, increase hope, comfort, and peace. Nah. No, definitely not the case for a lot of people. Five promised blessings now and forever. Unless you're like us. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, for... I mean, what it says, Go it's back down pretty to the bottom a bit. vague. So, as far as the first part, it says you'll privately and individually receive what are called the initiatory ordinances. And these include special blessings regarding your divine heritage and potential. Um, and then as part of this ordinance, you'll be authorized. And that's what they tell you. You'll be authorized to wear the temple garment and your temple garments are now activated. So we'll get to that. That's kind of where we're going with this. So all of that is pretty, and that's all it says about the initiatory. We'll probably read more about the endowment in that video. Um, but as far as preparation if you were like oh i want to know beforehand what i'm walking into there is no don't don't look on church sourced websites and things like that because they don't prepare you there's literally a class that i took we both took both of us took that pretty much everybody takes called preparing to enter the holy temple and you would think oh maybe they talk about what's going to go on in the temple no they there is no specifics of what is going on in the temple it's basically just a bunch of hype shit like oh you need to make sure that you're worthy oh we're gonna be dressed in white like no shit okay like there's nothing in the temple that even outlines what's going to go on you just go and people don't talk about what goes on in the temple because it's sacred not secret um with the caveat that there are some people that we've yeah come across in our journey who have said, I had a really good temple prep teacher who really went against what the manual says, which is not to get into specifics, <clears throat> went against that and kind of gave me an idea of what was going on and what was going to happen. Yeah. So there are those teachers out there and I give but credit the, to those teachers where it's due because nobody gets that yeah. really. That's the, the minority. General, the general consensus is that preparing to enter the holy temple does nothing to really help you understand what you're going to be walking into, what you're going to be consenting to before it actually happens. And that's one of the big points that we always sit on is there is no informed consent in the temple because you are in the thick of it and they're telling you that you, this is what you do. Like if you want to leave, you can, but there's huge societal or like just in group social consequences that could be uh, coming up for you if you choose to not. So, yeah. You don't really know what's going on before you you go in. So that's what the church says about it. Um, temple prep is 
<laughs> it's worthless. It doesn't prepare you for anything. And at, at that point, you've already gotten a temple recommend to go to the temple. So I don't think you need coaching on how to live worthy to answer the questions that the bishop and the stake president end up asking you. The washing and anointing, um, from what I can tell, originates from the Exodus, I think, uh, chapter 29, where Moses was instructed to wash and anoint the people before they enter the tabernacle or whatever. Most of what we're going to talk about is like just a giant interpolation of Jewish scripture that Joseph Smith was like, yep, this is it. And, uh, I'll just do what I want. And, you know, that's, that's what God would want because he did it in the past and I'll just do it the way that I want to. So, um, you can find some of this stuff in scripture and that's where I was like, oh, it is true, whatever. But like, they literally mentioned at the very beginning of the <laughs> pulling, pulling something as your source and then me coming back to the original source and being like, yes, the original source proves the thing just makes no sense. <laughs> so what happens? First of all, you have to get your temple recommend, right? You get your temple recommend. Everybody's making sure that you're worthy. You're not uh, sexually involved with somebody who's not your spouse. You're not, you know. You're paying your tithing. <laughs> You're not affiliated with any groups that have teachings contrary to the church. Yep. They want to make sure that you are good to go and you're going to be a good little noodle. You have a testimony. Follow the rules. You believe in all the prophets and support yeah. everything the prophets do or say. So you get to the temple, you check in. As it stands today, we'll talk about what it would look like today and what it looked like when I did it because it was different than today. And then what it would have looked like when my parents did it and maybe my parents' grandparents doing it. Because <laughs> there are some some key changes that have been made over the years. Um, and they get... Uh, they get weird. They get weird. Um, so, so anyway. Stay with us for weird shit. So stay with us, yeah. So nowadays, you go in to the temple... And you get dressed in your white clothing. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen our TikTok, what that looks like. It is not the temple robes that you get dressed up in. You would put on a white shirt, white tie, white pants, white socks, white slippers for the women. White dress, white socks, white bra. Although I did sometimes forget that and it was awkward. Um, Oops. (laughs) White everything, everything's supposed to be white. Yes. And uh, here comes the other disclaimer of... Gender is binary in the uh, the LDS mind. So we will only be talking about men and women because in their eyes, that's the only thing that exists. And these ordinances are separate <clears throat> for men yeah. and women. Um, the area where they do this is actually attached to the dressing room. So if Jordan and I went to the temple to do initiatory, the washing and anointing ritual, we would go to our, our uh, locker rooms our dedicated locker rooms and we wouldn't see each other until we got done. Like we'd be back in the lobby. That's the next time we would see each other. So after 45 minutes or an hour of yeah. doing an issue. So what a, it's a great date night to anybody who's wondering. So you get dressed up in your whites um, and you head over to the initiatory room. So we're just going to be talking about doing it for yourself. Basically, maybe we'll throw in because it's basically the same thing as you would do for the dead. They just change the, wording a little bit so the room in total it's partitioned off into three different areas um you walk in basically each area they're just closed off by a curtain kind of looks like a cubicle yeah most temples that i've been in it's like maybe six feet by six feet with a chair in almost all of the cubicles it's kind of weird except the last one except the last one Um, I also want to read the script of what they say so that uh, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So the first part, there's the washing and then the anointing. So the first part, you go into the first uh, sectioned off area. There's a man in there. He is the temple worker um, and he washes you symbolically. There's a basin of water with a very slow drip on it and he takes the water and he just rubs it across your forehead. I will also make a a note here. For men, the men do it. For women, 
women actually do it. Which, which is, is interesting because yeah. in any other case that does not happen. Um, as far as church history goes, way back when in church history, these things happened. But this is really yeah. the only opportunity within the church that women can put their hands on someone's head and anoint. Because that's a priesthood power, which women do not hold. And so this yeah. is really the only ordinance that's like this. So, yeah, that's that's the one kind of interesting thing that it, it's And that's unique. why I always went and did this ordinance. Well, because the endowment gave me anxiety. Yeah. But this, the, because this women would this. do it, yeah. yeah. So yeah. women would feel a lot more comfortable, nowadays, a lot more comfortable because they have women doing it. And so... It's still anxiety inducing for a lot of people. It's still way. awkward. But yeah. it is the same... The same thing is happening. So the wording is not any different, is it? Uh, there are a couple different things. But we'll by and large, the same thing's happening. So like you go in, you sit down, they do the water thing. Same thing's happening for men and for women. Yep. So anyway, um, he just wipes it across your forehead. Um, and then he pronounces these words. Brother, sister, hoo-ha, having authority. Uh, I wash you preparatory to your receiving anointings that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. So you'll, <laughs> you'll notice it became very clear to me when I first started going through the temple and progressing from this into the endowment that things kind of get kind of graphic and kind of intense. And you'll kind of see that pattern Pretty continue <laughs> throughout right this. off the bat. <laughs> like become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Like it's kind of aggressive. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry. So after that, they place their hands on your head and they pronounce a blessing. Basically, it's not anything per- personal. It's scripted. All of this is scripted. So. Basically, it's really long, and they go through each individual thing. So I wash your head that your brain and your intellect may be clear and effective, your ears that you can hear, the word of the Lord, your eyes that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error, your nose that may smell, your lips that may never speak guile, your neck that it may bear up your head properly, which I always thought was so stupid, your <laughs> shoulders that they may obey the burden, may bear the burdens that shall be placed thereon, your back that they may, may be marrow in the bones and the spine, your breast that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles, your vitals and bowels that they may be healthy and perform their proper functions, your arms and hands that they may be strong and wield the sword of justice in defense of truth and virtue, your loins that you may be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, that you might have joy in your posterity and your legs and feet that you might run and not be weary and walk and not faint. What was that point? That that part about the loins? Be fruitful, uh, be fruitful. and multiply and replenish the earth, aka have children. And people are like, no, they don't want you to they don't force you to have children. But the messaging is in be everything. Fruitful. And that's just one of them. So. Have joy in your posterity. It's very clear. So yeah. they run through that whole thing. And it is every long. time. They're and, sitting there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and and they usually the temple workers will usually memorize it. They do have the script on the wall if it's a if newer person or they forget. Yeah, so they can remind themselves. But every time, I mean, I would go through. I think one time I did twenty. It took me like an hour and a half at least. It it took forever. Okay, so after that, uh, the dude from the next cubicle, he comes in and they both put their hands on your head. And then they say, brother or sister, having authority, we lay our hands upon, oh wait, oh, uh, lay our hands upon your head and seal upon you this washing that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation through your faithfulness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that has, re- that's kind of reference to what they talk about in the endowment. So this is in preparation to receive that endowment. Um, so that's the first part. After that. You're sitting in a chair. I don't know if we mentioned that. You're sitting in a chair, so, in a chair. <laughs> so it's easy to put your, their hands on your head. You move. They just so they pull the curtain back. Uh, you go into the next cubicle, which is set up similarly. It's like six by six. Sit in you chair. sit in a chair. On the wall is a horn, which has oil in it, uh, which from what I could do, I, literally I didn't know what the significance of the horn while I was Mormon was. I looked up from what I can read in first Samuel 16. There's reference to Kings being anointed with oil. Uh, That was kind of, that wasn't even like an official church source. They don't talk about specifics like that really. Um, So yeah, that's the best I could find about that. Anyway. So the, uh, the officiator, the temple worker, he gets a little thing of oil and he 
puts it on your head. Sorry, he doesn't rub it across your forehead. Puts it on, it on your the head. crown of your head, which, you know, if you got, if you take care of your hair, you're like nasty, right? It's annoying. It's olive oil. It's uh, set apart for this. They, they do like the, the consecrated oil for the healing of sick and things like that. This is kind of similar. I don't know if they like bless it or whatever, but it is olive oil. It's not a significant amount either. Yeah. They it's like just take a, drop. a little. Yeah. But if you do it 20 times, you got 20 drops of oil on your head. Yeah. Shit is nasty. You got to yeah. go wash your hair. So after he does the little drop of oil on your head, similar thing. Same thing. Yeah. Again. Basically, so brother or sister having authority, I pour this holy anointing oil on your head uh, and anoint you preparatory for uh, to be preparatory to your becoming a king and a priest unto the most high God hereafter to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever. Um, That one, the wording is a little different for women. It would not be a king and a priest. It would be a queen and a priestess unto your husband, isn't it? Yes. Instead of unto the most high God. I think it's... What's that stink of? (laughs) Patriarchy. Patriarchy. Um, I don't know if they put God in there or not. I think... It might be your husband Let's look and at the God. Note. These notes were pretty. I'm reading off of LDSendowment.org. Women are anointed to become queens, queens and, priestesses and priestesses to their husbands. Um, uh, this was written up by a active member. So people like he literally went rogue and was and like, typed put all this, this shit up. up. So people would know what's going on before they go in. So bless his heart. But that's the difference. Becoming a queen and a priestess where it says for men unto the most high God. For women it says unto your husband. Yep. So after that, um, he puts his hands on your head again. And, or he, he doesn't remove his, his hands. He just keeps on going. And he does essentially the same thing in, except instead of wash he says, I anoint. So he says, I anoint your head, that your head, your brain and your intellect may be clear and active, your ears, that you, you may hear the word of the Lord, etc. I'm not going to read the whole thing over again, but it's exactly the same thing. He just says, anoint instead of wash. So then the guy from the next cubicle over comes in and they both put their hands on your head and they say, brother or sister, having authority, we lay our hands upon your head. <clears throat> And confirm upon you this anointing wherewith you have been anointed in the temple of our God, preparatory to becoming a king and priest unto the Most High God, or queen and priestess unto your husband, hereafter to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever, and seal upon you all the blessings hereunto appertaining to your faithfulness, faithfulness. or through your faithfulness, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so that's... Basically, the the end of the washing and the anointing bit. Have anything to add about that? Nope. Um, so the the key part there being through your faithfulness, all of this hinges on you continuing to be in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints for the rest of your life in order to quote unquote receive these blessings. Um, after that part, you stand up, you follow the other guy into the next cubicle which is you guessed it set up the same way six by six it's this time the last room is bigger i feel like it seems bigger because there's no basin there's no horn that's true and there's no chair that's true so the next one is where they activate your garment and we uh, we referenced this in the video that we talked about garments i read the exact same thing that i'm about to read uh, but he just stands there and just say, brother or sister, having authority, which I think is now um, under the proper authority or something. There was a, a wording change recently. I place this garment upon you, uh, which you must wear throughout your life. It represents the garment given to Adam when he was found naked in the garden and is called the garment of the holy priesthood. Inasmuch as you do not defile it, but are true and faithful to your covenants, it will be a shield and protection to you against your pa- the power of the destroyer until you have finished your work upon this earth. Um, so at this point, you've ar- you already have your garments on. You were instructed when you went into the locker room to put them on underneath your clothes. Um, so you already have it on. They just say, yeah, it's activated. Now. <laughs> Was that in the... Oh, they don't say active. 
Did they change that? I swear they did. They do say activated because I always thought of it as like when I went through for the first time, I was like, oh, it's like a cell phone. You get activated. Oh, it's also worth noting that um, in place of Adam being found in the garden, it says Eve for the women. No, it doesn't. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. This footnote says it does. I wouldn't know. I never did it in that capacity. (laughs) They may say Adam and Eve. I don't... I feel like they said Adam. <clears throat> anyway, so you have the garment. It gets activated. Also... Um, Magical. Yeah. People were asking about the uh, the garment and having your period. Oh, yeah. Do you want to just uh, address that real quick? Because <laughs> we got a lot of comments asking, what about on your period? What do you do? So, obviously, it's not ideal because it's white. Um so there's a few ways that you can go about it. I don't know of many people that would wear like actual underwear under their garments and put the gover- the government, the government, <laughs> put the garment on top of the actual underwear, the government's um, in your pants. That's what I did because it was extremely difficult to maintain, um, not staining the garments, um, at all. So It's really difficult. So some people will do that. Um, Some people just wear them as they are. Um, It's really difficult. It's difficult to work. If you were um, using tampons, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. Um, But there's this weird thing with tampons and Mormon women. Um, So a lot of them don't. But the whole wearing underwear underneath is not exactly by the book. Um, a lot of Mormons would find that anything. inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. They don't instruct you on anything Older related to periods. Women. There is nothing about that. Nope. Like what the instructions that you're given that we just read are all that you're told. Um, the only difference being that sometimes they will state before you go and have your initiatory done. Sometimes you sit down with the matron of the temple or one of the temple female temple workers that will clarify for you um, typically that you can wear a bra over or under the garment. Um, Because it used to be you couldn't wear it. You had to wear it like the bra over the garment because the garment had to be like closest to your skin. Um, But now it doesn't matter. So like the older generation of women will typically wear it like that. The younger generation of women typically don't. So, but you don't really get instructions on periods or anything of the sort. So it's not fun. (laughs) So maybe if, if you wanted to, you could buy your own like couple pairs of period garments. That way your your other ones don't get stained so bad. But really there's like, I mean, these are, these are white Cotton. fabrics that are literally bleached. Like they're dyed to get as white as they are. So any sort of like red or anything any like that is going to... Any type of woman discharge, which is normal. If you're yeah. a man in here and you're uncomfortable, get a grip. Um, Don't be a baby. <laughs> not all discharge is clear white. <laughs> so as far as like bright white temple garments go, it's it's very obvious. Yeah. Which is kind of annoying. So... Just wanted to touch on that because we did get a lot of comments. Fun anyway, fact: that'll be the last that we uh, really talk about the garment at Not length really. in, in this. We'll talk. We'll talk more. I was going to say in the end. We'll talk more. Um, okay, so after that, in the same cubicle, they give you what's called the new name. If you, I mean, we've talked Ooh. about Mike Norton recently on YouTube. He is new name Noah. So this is that what the that is referencing. So he's uh, the temple worker says with this garment, I give you a new name, which you should always remember and which you should keep sacred and never reveal except for except at a certain place that will be shown to you hereafter. He doesn't even say where or when Um, the name is blank and he gives you a new name. So that is the last of it. You exit, you, you go out the last curtain and then you go out and you go into the initiatory or the the endowment if you're doing which we'll it. talk about that yeah <clears throat> if you're doing yeah if you're doing it for yourself you would go immediately to the endowment it's you <clears throat> if do you're doing it for the dead one then you're you can doing just, a few yeah. and then you just go home you can you can do this separately for the dead and uh that's what we would do we would just go and do a couple and then leave um so the new name we want to talk about that i okay my experience i went in 
February 14th, 2015. It was the exact day that I would. All of this happened to me, um, and we'll explain a couple extra things, but I want to touch mainly the new name. This dude gave me my new name in that moment and for months to come. I was convinced that in that moment, he just had a revelation and said, this is your new name. And I was stunned. I was blown away. I was like, this is insane that they just, they give me a new name and it's something that I keep personal. I don't tell anybody. I thought it was so cool. That's what I thought too. So moving forward to even like, uh, to drive home the point at in the endowment they ask people because when you do it for the dead i mean if you've done it a million times sometimes you'll forget they ask if anybody has forgotten the new name and if they have they raise their hand and they take them out into the hall and give it to them that happened when i was there i thought that they would take them out into the hall and they just receive knowledge by the power of revelation by the power of revelation what that dead person's new name was and give it to them i I, those are thoughts that i had it wasn't until months later when i was at the mtc going in with other missionaries that i was close enough to the curtain when they gave the new name right before the endowment that i heard the same name that was just given to me and I was like, huh? And the other missionary comes out and he's like, oh, yeah, it's um, the same for everybody on the, the, any given day. I was, I was crushed. Uh, and then, yeah, I found out, hey, check this out. After we left the, the church, we found out that there's just a rotating list that on any given day. So to test it out, I knew mine. February 14th, you come here to fullerconsideration.com. Am I getting ahead of myself? No. You come here to fullerconsideration.com, and I'll throw a screenshot up here, but um, if you're uh, just listening, head on over to the Temple Name Oracle. They have three different charts here, um, and then before that, it was a little more convoluted, but um, let's see. I got mine after 2014. Just kind of go down this chart there. Day of the month, number 14. Oh, Isaiah. That was my temple name. So I was like totally crushed when I found that out. I was like, oh, it's not special to me. It was just everybody on that day got the same name. So it's a different name for women than it is for men. There's a list for men and there's a list for women. So I went on the 29th when I went... um, and mine was Phoebe. So and there's some really shitty names on here. Mind you, they're all from the Book of Mormon and they're all biblical. So they're not just like random. Yeah. Random names. Well, most most of the the women's names are from the Bible because there's only three named women in the Book of Mormon. And one of them's That's a harlot. Funny. So, yeah. Um, another interesting thing to note on here is that when you as an individual, when you go through for yourself and you get your new name, you're told to not tell it to anyone. Um, like at all. Very, Just like it very said, emphasized. You're not supposed to tell it to anybody except for one place in the temple. And in your lifetime, you're only going to say it one time for yourself. So you never say it to anybody after that. So you're not supposed to share it, not even with your spouse. And so for the duration of McKay and I being married, um, we did not tell each other what our names were until we left the church. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it was even a couple weeks after before I told her because I was, I was scared to tell her. It is very weird because they nail it in your head that you're not allowed to tell people these things. And so when you say things like that, it's like, oh my God. But here's the other caveat to this is when, I don't know if this is cultural or doctrinal anymore, but when you die, so like I die, let's say, then McKay dies. So he has to know my temple name because when we're both dead, he's going to call me by my temple name and then... Well, yeah, we'll, we'll explain a little bit more about that when we get to the ceiling because there was a experience that we had that, ref- that uh, has to do with that. When you told me your new name, remember? 
we literally went to the veil to do it. Do you not remember that? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I was that's like, right. what? That's right. So, uh, but the whole point is gender inequality, again, where men get to know what their wives are, but you don't get yeah. to know what your husband's is. So, there you go. So, the new name is crazy. I couldn't believe it. It was... I was gutted when I found out that it was literally just a list and it's the same every day for every person across the entire world. Like if they go on that same day. So yeah, that's weird. So we'll talk about the new name more in the endowment because it has to do with that. That's where you, uh, you give the name. Um, but that's just kind of the, the rundown of the washing and anointing as it is today. And earlier I made reference, I was like, oh, isn't it funny how the Lord's way to do things just changes all the damn time? Because when I went through, this is 2015. Jordan got, that was 2016 that you went, right? It had to have been. You were endowed way before. Was it 2016 or was it 2017? No, it was 2016. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So I go through the temple and uh, there's a really major difference between what we just described and what I described, and we will further get more different as we go back in time. When I went, rather than getting fully dressed, I went into my locker. I put on just the temple garment, which is underwear, right? Remember. (laughs) The top and the bottom. And then I put on this very stylish, uh, what they called, or they referred to as a shield to me. poncho. It is like, yeah, it's basically like, you know, those garment bags that, that they put a, uh, over your suit after you get it at the dry cleaner. It was basically like that or like one of the permit ones, not like the plastic ones, basically like that. And the it didn't have to be open in the sides anymore uh, because everything was the same. So I did all of that in just my underwear <laughs> and a poncho on, which made me feel extremely uncomfortable um but in the end it wasn't like that bad it was enough it was weird enough that i was like that's odd but i could rationalize it away so mccann i didn't go through this process many years apart but by the time i went through it was different like you didn't go in and just your garments you wore a dress yeah so you did exactly as we as we just described yeah so just in that time period it was it It changed changed. which is a, a pretty big change if you ask me um but I'm sure if people were doing it for the dead, they didn't want to strip down to their garmies and uh, go and do that for like an hour. But it gets worse. Anyway, so if you, before 2005, went through the temple, you didn't even get to wear your garments in there. You went into your locker and you stripped down and you put the poncho on and that was it you were completely naked under your poncho up Boom. until 2005 like the 21st century 2005 you're naked under a poncho and at this point the poncho had slits down the side because it gets worse um before 2005 all of the washing and the anointing was much less symbolic because they would have to take water and rather than just swipe it across your forehead, they would have to drop water on all of the specific places that are outlined in the script. In the script. And this is where things get weird and a lot of people have been very vocal about these things because you get touched in places. If you remember. Like your breast. They your clarify loins. that you're supposed to just touch the sternum, not like your groping boobs, boobs and stuff like that but you also get touched in your groin which you're just supposed to touch like above the upper inner thigh um but i can't like the hip bone you, or something yeah how many people i have heard stories of where they have been like essentially groped and sexually assaulted in the temple this is supposed to be like the pinnacle of mormonism And they get sexually assaulted and traumatized for basically the rest of their life, which is not good. And this happens twice. Two different people are going to do it. You do it once for the water and once for the anointing. So it's different people. Two different people 
Two different times. Two different times. Touching your naked body. Appropriate? I think not. No. And I guarantee that not anywhere are they going to say that, yeah, before you go to the temple, just know that you're going to be fucking naked and we're going to touch your naked body with water and oil. Like, if they had told me that up front, no way. Not a way. There's not a chance in hell. Like, that that would have been okay with me. And that's so why they don't tell you. They wouldn't tell you because they can just kind of ambush you. And what are you going to say? No. So you can't go on your mission. You're going to say no so you can't get married. You're going to say no and all your family is in the temple with you yeah. and you're just going to peace out. Literally all of your family people ancestors before you did this and you're going to be the one that says no they can't handle it because the mormons that watch us and there's quite a few get their garmies in a bunch when they watch our stuff because they're going to sit here and they're going to say everybody who's in the temple presented with these things can leave and anybody can walk out at any time (laughs) and while that is true it completely neglects the societal and cultural pressure that exists within Mormonism, that if you don't confine or conform to these things, um, there are going to be social consequences for this. So if you choose to leave um, in the middle of any of these ordinances, in the middle of the endowment, and you and your your fiancé are planning on getting married in the temple because that's a very... That's a very yeah. pinnacle of Mormonism type thing. You can't get married in the temple after that. Then you can't get married in the temple and then you have to cancel your temple ceiling and then your fiance is going to be like, what the hell? And then your family is going to be like, what the hell? And then it, it's going to be this cascading effect of all these horrible cultural and societal and social things within the church that are now placed upon you. And so it, it doesn't really allow for someone to one, have informed consent and for two, to really consider like maybe I don't want to do this because the stakes are so high and the consequences are so grand that it really doesn't leave you room to be like you know what no this doesn't sit right with me I'm not going to do it yeah it is and and especially with the initiatory as far as I know that now they don't have any point where they're like if you don't wish to continue you can say at any time they don't say that they do they absolutely do not say that there's like any like panic button or anything like that you just do it because that's what you do so i couldn't imagine being naked in the temple and that's this is where people are like do you get naked in the temple if if you had asked me a year exactly a year ago i would have been like where the hell would you even (laughs) think that and literally we're talking about 17 years ago i was alive 17 years ago and they people were naked in the temple with a poncho on. And this is, it's not anything, it definitely does not leave anything up to the imagination. It's not like really a poncho. It's just a covering so that they can cover their asses. So, yeah. That's not even the worst, really. No. Um, this is just like the beginning. This is just the... Oh, well, that's not... Are you talking about the beginning of what? all of the temple shit? What do you mean? There's still a level deeper on uh, the change that has made it made it been made to the temple initiatory. Oh. Um, I'm going to put a picture up here. This was the original um, layout of the initiatory area for the Salt Lake Temple when it was uh, finished in the early 20th century. Um, so basically, I don't know when they changed it exactly. Does it say down here? No, it just says from the 19th, sometime in the earliest, tw- early 20th century um, was when they instituted the the shield. But when the uh, endowment was uh, officially instituted, um, there was a tub in there and there was no shield uh, you literally were naked and they would physically wash you and pour oil all over you. Like you would sit in a tub and they would wash you. So not symbolically anymore, not symbolic at that point. Um, so sometime during the 20th century, they decided, yeah, that's weird. And people are going to leave the church and out us for being weird, weird. as shit. 
Um, but at that point, they had been doing it for at least 60 years because it was the endowment was in early 1840s that they instituted it. So people had been getting naked in the temple and being touched by temple workers for decades by the time that they were like, maybe we need to change it. Nobody, I mean, there were probably people, there were obviously people who thought this was weird, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because if you were that far in already, they already had you for the most part. So when people defected and you're like, yeah, I was sexually assaulted in the Mormon temple. Who is going to believe you? There's plenty of There's people like that. No... There's plenty of people. Yeah. Who've had that experience. And it's... It's not few and They're far older. Between. They're older because these this yeah. whole ritual was happening. People my, my parents' age. Yeah. I mean, anybody who did this up through 2005 had their naked body touched in the Mormon temple, which is just wild to me. So, That's yeah. It's for a good date night. Man. <laughs> When other people are touching Jeez. you instead of your spouse. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm glad that that wasn't what we had the experience of. But sh- holy shit, it is. It's weird. It To think about how it was back then, it's even more weird. And I mean, I'm not somebody from the ni- the, 18- the 19th century, but uh, so it sounds pretty weird to me. I'd... Who knows? Maybe times have changed and we're just prudes now, but Jesus, I can't imagine that there were not people who were like, Joe, are you sure about this? <laughs> are you sure we really need to get naked to do this? Well, and the Mormons are going to come up in here and be like, I never had that experience. That never happened to me. And that's great and wonderful. And I'm happy for you. But that doesn't yeah. mean that just because your experience wasn't that, it doesn't mean that other people didn't have that yeah. experience. Don't invalidate what other people have experienced just because it didn't happen to you. Yeah. Okay. To that, I say, good for you. Do you want a cookie? I honestly, that's great. That's great. I'm but glad that never happened to you. People have been abused and people are scarred because of what that has happened to them so good for you but we're we're not going to have any of that if you want to write a comment about how you didn't have that and that doesn't happen just save it i don't care we don't Um, care (laughs) yeah anyway that is the washing and the anointing like we said after that that's the first part of the endowment you do the washing and the anointing and then you go to the endowment proper. Um, I don't know how we're going to do the endowment proper, really. The endowment is where shit gets weird. It gets wild. I mean, this is pretty weird, but it gets like full blown cult wild up in here. Um, but it's important that we lay this foundation and this might have seemed a little dry compared to things that we've talked about before and things that you've maybe seen about the endowment, but this is an important kind of building up to the endowment because a lot of the endowment won't make sense, um, without this piece because the endowment is really dense and complex. Yeah, you gotta talk about the, the new name, which is, which is the main thing that you want to hit when you talk about the initiatory. Right. So. So, yeah, um... One thing I did have to add, like this definitely is dry, but it's also important to know that they have watered it down immensely from what it has become. It was so fucking weird for so long. And why do you think that they've done that? Yeah. (laughs) Maybe it's because people didn't ever go back to the temple and they didn't want to do it. They have to water it down because nobody wants to get naked to do initiatories for some random dead people who don't consent also to being having their naked bodies touched. So yeah, I don't even know what more to say about that. It's weird and uh, it's only going to get weirder. Yeah. If you think this is weird, buckle up. (laughs) Yeah. Still trying to figure out what we're going to do. It's got to be two videos. It's got to be two parts. Um, Maybe we will react to it because new name noah did a hidden camera and there's there's a lot to unpack about the whole experience of being in the room when you receive the endowment um so we will uh make some decisions and we'll uh, get everything ready so it can go as easy as possible so yeah stay tuned for all of that don't worry this won't be going anywhere it has a finite number of episodes that we know we're going to do so 
don't worry, we're not going <laughs> to give up on it because people want to know about it. Um, if you have any further questions, make sure you throw them down in the comments. Um, you can, you, there's a couple different ways you can reach us. Otherwise we do read the comments. We go through them. Um, we don't get to all of them sometimes cause, uh, some, maybe we're going to make a video that will explain it and we don't explain it in the comments. Um, you can also contact us through our discord, which is linked down in the description. That's a really easy way to get in contact with us. Cause I like quick and easy communication. Um, you can also find us on Instagram and TikTok via at Jordan and McKay. Jordan does read some of the DMs on that, but she gets a lot of DMs and people responding to the story. So it's kind of a lot to uh, sort through. But make sure you follow us on there because we do, one, I update it daily, and two, we do a lot of, we ask for a lot of feedback on there. Yeah. So if we're doing a video and I'm looking for questions, I'll I'll typically take questions from Instagram. And we post, like, we post all our video updates and ask for topic suggestions and things. So if you really want to be involved with the process, Instagram is a good place to go. Yeah, definitely check it out. I want to give a shout out to our patrons. We've gotten a bunch of new patrons and you all are amazing. So the shit. literally the shit. Thank you to all the new patrons and welcome. If you would like to support us on Patreon, you can find the link in the description. It's just patreon.com slash Jordan and McKay. Um, but yeah, it's really been awesome and we're really happy to have all of you. Um, anyway, other than that... Oh, let's give them their new name for today. Oh, so if you made it this far, guess what? You get a new name. We're going to <laughs> give you the new name. Um, today, the day that this is uploading is going to be January 4th, the fourth day of the month. If you identify as a female, then you your new name is Grace. If you identify as a male, your new name is Gabriel. If you don't fall into either of those, you can pick whichever one you want. We'll give you that much, which is way more licensed than you'd get in the Mormon temple. So it's true. all my Grace and Gabriels go forth and uh, be parts of the, the Satan's Ponzi scheme. Um, yeah, so if you stayed this far into the video, thank you, everybody, and we will see you next time. <laughs>